Our first reading comes to us from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It's just one verse. I'm going to speak it once, but then I'm going to ask if you would repeat it with me twice. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, you join me. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Say it again. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of this God's word. I want to invite you into a time of prayer. Now, if you are watching this worship service with someone else, I want you right now to just put us on pause and talk to each other. What is it that you would like to have prayed about this day? And then take a time to simply pray. Maybe one of you prays or all of you pray, or maybe you take turns. But whatever it is, take time just to pray with each other, even if it's just in silence. That's powerful. Let's pray together. Lord of love and Lord of life, we come before you acknowledging that there are so many ways in which we are weak and flawed, so many ways that we have fallen out of peace, out of the peace that is marked by your love. And so we pray, guide us, guard us, that as we walk through life day by day, step by step, that we might know your love, a love that fills us to overflowing, a love that is shared with our neighbors. For we would remember those words that come to us from scripture, you will love your neighbor as yourself. You will love your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. You will love, you will love. Lord, help us and guide us. Be the light in our life that shines in the darkness, the light that shatters the darkness, for even the smallest light breaks the dark. So gracious God, we pray for those dark places in our lives. We pray for those places that are struggling with fire and flood and pandemic. We pray for our marriages. We pray for our finances. We pray for our families. Lord, we pray for health and strength, for calmness and peace and patience, especially with those who try our patience so deeply. Lord of love, help us to love. This we would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The gospel reading today comes from the gospel according to Matthew in the 22nd verse. This is called the great commandment. Jesus was in the temple and had just been in heated conversation with the Pharisees and Sadducees. And one of the experts on the law came to him and said this, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello, my name is Kevin Nakajima, and I'm a musician and the tech coordinator here at Spearfish United Methodist Church. I love this church, the people in it, and the many missions it takes on, but I really consider myself to be a Unitarian Universalist. For me, this means that great truths can be found in a myriad of sources. Therefore, we will be hearing from Greek myth today, as well as the Bible. In the interest of all transparency, I wanted you to know where I am coming from theologically. I also have no real interest in a life in the clergy. However, they say that everyone has one good book in them. I bet the same could be said of sermons. I've had this one rattling around in my brain for over a year and finally need to let it out. In the Odyssey, we see the great Greek tactician Odysseus taking a long and often torturous trip back home to Ithaca following the Tro Trojan War. He and his crew encounter many fantastic events, but there is one that Odysseus was smart enough to plan for. He saw that they would be passing the home of the Sirens. The Sirens are considered a mythical creature that would sing a mesmerizing song to lure sailors to their deaths and eat them. 
he let his curiosity get the best of him. He wanted to experience the temptation himself, but knew it would be the ruin of his crew. Therefore, he got his entire crew to plug their ears with beeswax and then tied him so tightly to the mast that he would not be able to escape. He was tied so that the temptation was there, but he could not act on it. There's also the story of when the area known as Phrygia was without a ruler. The people were growing more and more distressed, and the fights were breaking out. They finally resorted to the same thing all the Greek mythological people do when they can't figure out a problem. They went to an oracle, this one in Telmissus. Oracles were those that they trusted to see the future. Their temples were built on fissures that allowed gases to escape the earth. The oracles would go down into a forbidden chamber over the gases, which then the gases would accumulate, and then they'd hallucinate or see the future. The oracle says they should return home and wait for the next person to enter the city, driving an ox cart. This would be their new king. Soon, a peasant farmer named Gordius drove up and was immediately named king. In gratitude, his son Midas dedicated the cart to the Phrygian equivalent of Zeus, the Greek king of the gods, and tied it to a post. Eventually, the people wanted to move the cart out of the way, but found that they could not release the knot. Another trip to an oracle ensued. The prophecy was now that whoever could undo that knot would become ruler of the world. We only know that the knot existed because Alexander the Great is the one who eventually takes it on. He either just pulls the post out of the knot, or he simply cuts it in half with his sword. Either way, he was able to cut himself free from the popular superstition that might have held him back from his conquering spree. These two stories are important because I had the honor of taking a world religions class one summer at Northern State University that included the Latin teacher from Peer Public Schools as a fellow student. His name is Jay Mickelson. One day, he explained to the class where the word religion comes from. The base of that word is ligio, which means to be tied or bound to. The re is just a modifier of degree. In this case, it means more than just tied or bound. I like to say that religion is something that you are bound tightly to. Also, I say that there are two kinds of religion in this world. There is the organized religion and the personal religion. Organized religions are the ones that are followed by groups of people. They are full of creeds and dogmas. They are hard to change as they depend on the collective thought of what a divine being expects of us. However, they can be easier to hold on to as you have accountability with each other. They are not our focus today. That lies in personal religion, which consists of the concepts, habits, and material things you are willing to tie yourself to. A good example of the difference comes from one of the most well-known leaders of an organized religion in the world, the Dalai Lama. He said, This is my simple religion. No need for temples. No need for complicated philosophy. Your own mind, your own heart is the temple. Your philosophy is simple kindness. Where do our personal religions, our lenses, take us? Well, it's been 20 years since that terrible fall. Of course I remember where I was on that horrific September day. I remember watching TV and the breaking news coming on, having to go tell mom who was doing some ironing to come see what was going on, the drive to eighth grade at Prescott Mile High Middle School, watching on the school TVs all day, buildings and lives being destroyed, the fear, the anger, we all got bound up tightly in our emotions on that day, and at times, it seems ever since. We got mad at anyone who practiced Islam for the actions of what amounted to the KKK of their religion. We got mad at the Sikhs for looking somewhat like those who practiced Islam. My mom was part of a jazz choir at the time. Her conductor was of Italian heritage, 
and he was harassed and blamed because someone thought he looked Middle Eastern. The week settled into a lull of when is the next big scary thing going to happen? For many people, nothing did, but the fear remained and kept us shackled. I also very much remember October 5th of that same year and the days that followed. Ignorance is bliss, is what my middle sister used to yell at me as she dropped me off to middle elementary school. It certainly was a kind of bliss before finding out that a man had attacked her, forced himself on her, and nearly killed her. I remember rushing from school and packing to take the four-hour journey to Tucson. I remember laying in the suburban backseat, watching the headlights flash past, blocking out the world with my favorite 70s greatest hits cassette tape. Hey there, lonely girl, won't you play another somebody done somebody wrong song and tell me everything's gonna be all right. I remember my normally cheery sister in an extremely fragile state. Before long, we all knew that Osama bin Laden was the leader of the group responsible for 9-11. And my sister, the other 10 victims over five states and their families, knew that James Allen Selby was responsible for our pain. Selby was caught within a year and convicted in both Colorado and Arizona. All 11 remarkable women faced him at his trials. A couple years later, he kills himself in prison. But while not a huge piece of my thoughts, my anger at him still seethes below the surface for several more years, as it does Bin Laden. Little pieces of me are bound to hatred of these two men. Ten years ago, it's May 1st, 2011, and my roommate and I have the news on while we play Go Fish, when President Obama comes on and says that the Navy SEALs have killed Bin Laden. As I am turning 23 the next day, my mind immediately says, best birthday present ever. I am pretty happy the rest of the night, but after sleeping on it, I am disappointed in myself for having that thought. My birthday suddenly becomes a day of far more introspection than usual. I realize that these feelings of rage, revenge, and hatred aren't good for me. I've heard it said that letting these feelings percolate within you is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. I could not expect others to die from my pain, especially those who had already died. Like Alexander the Great, I had to release myself from what could hold me back from my best self. So I chose the only method that would cut me free from my fetters of anger and revenge. I chose forgiveness. I chose to cut away those heavy weights on my soul, to be happy that pathways of violence had been removed from the world, but not to wish ill will on them anymore. My memories of those days are still darkly tinged, but they make me think of the strength of ordinary people and that of my sister instead. And then I heard about this guy named Shandor Tesler. He was a Hungarian Jew who owned a textile mill during World War II and fled almost too late to our shores. In the process, he and his family were beaten and nearly killed by the Nazis. Late in life, he audited classes at Wolford College in South Carolina, where one day a professor was expounding on how evil the world is. After class, Tesla walked up and with gentle reproach said, you know, doctor, human beings are fundamentally good. His words allowed me to have a great respect for the dangers of this world, but not a fear of them. I was suddenly unbound from those emotions, and I struggled to keep myself unbound every day. It's the only healthy way. Speaking of health, many of you know that I recently had a week-long hospital stay. It was the result of a blood pressure of 253 over 141, and a lot of fluid retention. I didn't have any chest pain at all. I only felt the near constant need to go to the bathroom and never having any results from it for an entire day. I've had kidney stones before, so I expected it to be that, not something that acutely threatened my life. A lifestyle of worry, 
stress, improper eating, and far too much idleness had nearly dragged me six feet under. I had to unbind myself from as much of that as possible. I am now tied to a life of only two grams of salt a day, only two liters of liquid a day, and to start moving for cardiac health more. The medicine during the hospital got, stay got my blood pressure under control and removed 12 liters of fluid from my system, or about the equivalent of 26 pounds. Since then, I have kept the diet going and have moved around more and more each day, resulting in another 20 pounds lost and generally normal blood pressure. I am allowing myself to be bound, like Odysseus, to a safe foundation to the next step of my health journey, the next nutrition calculation, the next day's schedule, and it is helping me make progress. In the scriptures we heard today, we get to the foundation of what every human should be anchored to, no matter what religion they follow. The building blocks for creating the kingdom here on earth now, and not waiting to get into the one in heaven. In Christianese, it is said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Also, be subject to one another in reverence to Christ. The first is easy. Love, know, and feel with your entire being the wonder of the creative force in the universe that is as much a, so much bigger than you and yet also within you. Know that you are a small thread in an immense, beautiful tapestry. Love your neighbor and be subject to one another in reverence to Christ are kind of part and parcel together. There was a Roman playwright named Terence who had this to say, Homo sum humani nihil ame alianam puto, or I am human. Nothing that is human can be alien to me. We must love our neighbors without judgment, because whatever they or you or I are doing, it, it's human. No matter what actions we or our neighbors take, they will never be perfect. So it's best to untie ourselves from expecting perfection from ourselves or what we think perfection is from others. We must go even further and be subject to one another. Our best chance of building the kingdom comes from serving each other. And that service can be small or big in our eyes, but it will make all the difference. Sometimes we can feel like we are a drop in the ocean with our actions. But what is the ocean but many, many drops? Finally, we must love ourselves. This does not mean giving in to every baser instinct and caring, carrying and caring only about what we want. That is being a slave to ourselves. We love ourselves by forgiving other, ourselves and others, by doing our best to rid ourselves of emotions that would drag us down. We are not perfect, or at least I know I'm not. I wasn't loving myself when I let the anger fester inside me towards those who brought such pain and sorrow for so long. I wasn't loving myself when my lifestyle landed me in the hospital. I had to untie myself from the things that were enslaving me in order to find the love that would save me. I have chosen to tie myself to love, to curiosity, to wonder, to forgiveness, to a better lifestyle. I am not perfect. Sometimes I'm like a little kid who lets go of the balloon and it can feel like it's going to all float away. But I jump up and I reach higher and God helps pull it down to my level and soon I remember what joy feels like and I'm tied to it again. And gravity helps bind me back down to the ground of responsibility, forgiveness, and knowledge of my imperfections. Proper balance is achieved. I am neither higher nor lower in mindset than I need to be. So I challenge you every minute of the rest of your life to examine what is lifting you, what is keeping you grounded, and which parts you need to be bound to for balance and for exactly what is necessary to build the kingdom of God around you. Amen. I want to take a moment and dedicate something that is new on our altar. This 
is a light of hope. And it now, as of today, becomes a fixture on our altar. This light was given in memory of George and Alice Helmer. And it was just a joy to talk to George and Alice. They were such an amazing couple and so loving. And over the years, the love that they shared with our communities, with their families, with the church, was so deep. So tonight, we look at this and, and know that it is the light of God that is the hope of God, the hope of this world. We dedicate this in the name of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, we simply dedicate this light to you, that as it stands now on our altar, it may shine for years and years to come as a reminder that there is hope in our world. Lord, as we dedicate it, so we ask that we would remember the love of those who gave it and remember the love of those who need it. Gracious God, be present in this light and help us to hope always. Amen.